Okay, hello everyone who is coming in to the virtual tour of intentional communities. My name is Cynthia and I am calling in from Vermont, traditional Abenaki land. And I live at a intentional community called Headwaters Eco Village here in Vermont. Um, we're not gonna be talking so much about my community today. I'm just here to facilitate and support the conversation with two wonderful communitarians. We have with us Leslie from Touchstone Co-housing in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Hillary from Magic Community in Palo Alto, California. So really glad to have both of you with us. And we also have an additional community coming in a bit later. They're located in Hawaii. So it's very early in the morning there. So they asked if they could join in a, like a half an hour or so later. And that's going to be Amara from La Aka community in Hawaii. Okay, so I'm really looking forward to learning about these communities and having discussion. We have lots of Q&A time uh, built into this as well. So for everyone who's um, watching uh, via Facebook Live, feel free to leave comments. If you're watching on Zoom, feel free to uh, ask your questions as well. And I'm going to start us off by sharing my screen. I have a short presentation that I want to run through with you. So once again, this is our uh, virtual tour of Intentional Communities panel event. We are getting in the rhythm of doing these every month. So if you are part of an intentional community and you'd like to see your community be featured on one of these events, please let us know. Um, you can contact us at connect at ic.org and we'd be happy to um, see about getting you on to one of these events. All right, so first off, this is an event being hosted on Zoom webinar. Um, we're probably all becoming more and more familiar with Zoom, but if you're new to using Zoom, uh, just to let you know that you can um, ask your questions using the raise your hand button if you'd like to share your question out loud and in the Q&A box if you have a question just for one of our panelists or all of our panelists. And then you can use the chat box to communicate with everyone who is um, listening in to this event. So we'd love if you could use the chat box now to introduce yourself, use this as an opportunity to network with other community interested folks from all around the world. Go ahead and share where you are calling in from. If you live in an intentional community, let us know which one. And also share what you hope to learn or get out of this session. And I'll try to shift and guide the conversation towards those things that you want to learn. Okay, and really briefly, I want to share about two of our upcoming online courses. All of our online courses are um, available to view at ic.org slash learn. They're all five week long cohort courses focused on a different aspect of starting an intentional community, joining an intentional community, living in community. And I wanna highlight two upcoming courses in particular. Um, starting on June 2nd, we have a B Building Diverse and Inclusive Communities course. And I know this has been something that's on, been on the minds of a lot of individuals and intentional communities about how to be more welcoming to people of all walks of life, all ethnicities, socioeconomic status, gender identity. How can we just really help to shift this movement towards greater diversity? So I'm super excited about this course with Crystal Farmer, who is the author of the recently published book, The Token, where she talks about um, a lot of the um, aspects she's going to be covering in her course about how to build in more diversity and inclusion into the culture of your community, organization, any type of group. And I also want to share about the Thriving in Community course, which is all about how you can 
learn about intentional community living if you're not yet part of the community, and also those essential skills to really thrive in a cooperative culture setting. Most of us didn't grow up in intentional community. I certainly didn't. And boy, oh boy, have I learned so much about myself and about other people and how to function in group settings through this process. And I really wish I had taken a course like this before I started living in community. Um, it would have saved me a lot of really painful learning experiences. So grateful to Lee Warren of Earth Haven Community for offering this course. And we have a special discount for everyone who's tuning into the virtual tour of communities event. Um, we'd like to offer you all 30% off the full price of those two courses I just mentioned with the Grow IC discount code applied at checkout. And this is only valid through Sunday, this upcoming Sunday, because the courses are starting next week. Um, so act on this. If you want to get the discount and join one of the courses, um, act on it this weekend. All righty. So that's all that I have for you guys and gals and everyone who's, who's watching. Um, before we jump into the main part of our event today, just take a moment to look around your space maybe push aside any distractions, maybe have something to drink nearby, um, any note-taking materials if you'd like that. And just sort of, yeah, center yourself, arrive, oof, maybe let go of whatever else happened earlier in your day and get ready to spend the next 90 minutes together, giving your full attention to our wonderful presenters who are with us. Okay. Um, so as always, I'm really excited to have communities really from all parts of the United States, not all parts, but a diversity of parts and also a diversity of different types of communities. Um, we have co-housing, a service-oriented community, um, a community in Hawaii that's more small and focused on the land. And I see that Amara has joined us as well from La Kea community. Hello, Amara. Oh, and you have company. Hi, hi. Great. Okay. So we're going to start off by um, giving the floor to Leslie from Touchstone Co-housing. Um, the format is that each of our presenters has about 10 minutes to share about their community. We'll open it up briefly for questions specifically about that community and then go on to the next community. And at the end, we'll have a big round of discussion, conversation, and open it up to all kinds of questions. So with that said, welcome, Leslie. Do you want to go ahead and give your, your sharing about your community? Hi, welcome. I just wanted to say I was looking in chat and reading everybody's name and where they're from, and I, I'm so excited to have people just from all over the country um, checking in. So I'm glad I remembered to put maps in mine. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. All right. <clears throat> so we are Touchstone Co-housing in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And this is sunset over touchstone. Now, I just want to uh, touch bases real quickly on what co-housing is. Uh, I know many of us on this call will know, but we might have a few people who are unfamiliar. So um, on the continuum of intentional communities, I'd say that co-housing is probably the most like uh, living in the real world. Um, we Something happened there. <laughs> yeah, we lost your we lost your presentation. Okay, let um, me. Do you want to try try again? Uh. Hmm. Hmm. Wait a second. 
I've lost my cursor. Yeah, you may need to refresh. Um, well, unfortunately, I can't. If I don't have a cursor, I don't know how to do anything. Oh, it's more like it's invisible. Mm. Sharing paused. Um, maybe try to come out of. Let's see here. I can. See I've never I can. had something like this happen. Sorry, guys. No worries. That's right. Um, Oh gosh. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Um, Between not being able to generate a cursor, so my ability to navigate my computer is like nigh on gone. Because um, it's telling uh, me to bring a window to the front, but unfortunately, without control of my computer, can't I don't know mm -hmm. I might have to sign out and sign okay I just removed your sharing so we can just try that again are you able to um see your clicker now no I, I have control over my computer um sorry for this disruption guys maybe I should sign out and sign back in okay sure yeah, and we can um, we can go to Hillary next if if you're ready to share. Okay, you just need to unmute. Oh, hey, I found myself. Oh, you found yourself. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's totally fine. Mistakes happen. We're all we're all learning about this Zoom. It's a wonder that we can get people from all over the place able to connect in that way. Um, we still just see a white screen though. Uh, yes, uh, I ended up with the same problem. I mean, I, I'm back to the same thing. So go ahead and uh, log me out because now I don't have a cursor again. So do what you did last time and I will sign out even if my cursor returns. Okay, all right, no worries. Okay, so. We'll, um, we'll go now to Hillary, um, if you can unmute yourself. Unmute, there I go, and I'll share okay. my screen. Okay, thanks oh, for please. jumping in. <laughs> let's see, so let's say in host disable participant screen sharing. Okay, let's make you co-host there. All right. I see you. Yeah, I know, but I wanna share my presentation. Should be able to share now. Yes, here I go. Here we go. Okay. You guys see that? Yep. Oh, looks right. good. Okay. Yay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Cynthia, for including Magics in today's virtual tour. We're grateful for this opportunity to share our community with everyone you've brought together. We're also mm -hmm. grateful for all the work that you at FIC have done and are doing to inform and inspire greater cooperation through intentional community. In the next 10 minutes, I'll offer a bit of my personal story to shed light on how I came to a third of a century at MAGIC, a community dedicated to value science for common good. I'll also outline what we are and do, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and responding to your questions. Oops, why is it not moving? There we go. I was on my way to magic from an early age. For as long as I can remember, I've cared about common good. After Earth Day in 1970, as a preschooler, I started singing, give a hoot, don't pollute, with Woodsy Owl. <laughs> from fifth through 12th grades, I poured my heart and soul into future problem solvers of America. In high school, I was a peer tutor and a summer volunteer poverty worker with the elderly in Appalachia. In college, I studied biology and psychology. I wanted to learn how to remedy individual, social, and environmental ills. In 1988, I took an environmental ethics course that required an action project. I trained with MAGIC to lead volunteers in planting 200 oaks. I felt responsible for the trees, so I came back to water them. We carried water from a tinker truck. 
Today, these oaks we planted 33 years ago are 30 feet tall. I like the people, I like their ideas too. They grounded their lives and value science and they walked their talk. They lived cooperatively, they biked everywhere. They improved their neighborhood. While I was in college and during my adventures working summers for the National Park Service and after graduation with a Peace Corps-like program in Indonesia, I kept in close touch with magic friends and felt an increasing sense of shared purpose and approach. In 1992, I moved into the magic community. Magic is people who share a place we call home, work with common purpose on public service projects and ground our lives in value science philosophy. Here we're sharing nightly dinner and a magic fellow is teaching a Stanford value science course. People who envisioned an intentional community rooted in magic, rooted in value science for common good came together as magic in 1972. Four years later in 1976, they bought this home. In 1979, they incorporated as a public service organization and began planting street trees. The public service organization governed by the five person board of trustees in the Blue Oval owns Magic's land, buildings, equipment and furnishings and sponsors the intentional community guided by the five Two fellows serve also as trustees. We aim to decide consensually and to achieve outcomes acceptable to everyone. As we find common ground in deliberations like this house meeting, we weigh three C's demonstrated competence, prior contribution, and commitment into the future. We're diverse. More than 200 people countries and nearly every US state have made magic home for months or years. Here, Chinese, Danish, French, Indian, Iranian, Portuguese, Swiss, US, and Vietnamese magicians celebrate a birth birthday. During COVID, we lived very cautiously and stopped admitting new residents as some residents departed. We, re we remained multi-generational, 17 to 84, multinational and multi-ethnic. As the pandemic has abated, we've begun reviewing application and applications and accepting new residents. Tangible benefits of residency at Mad include private room, shared spaces, furnishings and equipment, utilities, nightly dinners, and priority access to classes and educational events like this presentation by a Stanford ecology professor. More important are less tangible events of living with friends who share values. Together, we learn to see self, others, and world more accurately. Together, we grow a gift economy. Together, we celebrate everyday activities like this haircut and special events like this 21st birthday beach party in the midst of the pandemic. First responsibilities of living at MAGIC are learn value science and contribute public service. Each of us devotes one to several hours weekly to these. Each also contributes six hours per week to, to maintain the household and provide nightly dinners. Some residents who earn livelihood outside MAGIC or study full-time contribute about $1,500 a month. For perspective, in our neighborhood, we can earn $20 walking a dog. Others work 20 hours per week in lieu of monetary contribution or combine work and money. Fellows work more, sometimes much more, to uphold their responsibilities as residents and to shoulder the lion's share of responsibility for delivering Magic's public services. Here, a fellow presents value science at Ford Labs. At Magic, we de demonstrate loving community by caring for each other and our home. Visitors often exclaim, it's so clean. This is how our kitchen looks between mealtimes, though we're, we've flowers only on occasion. Magic is also a laboratory. At Wright, a fellow explains our innovative passive house to architects and builders touring it. At Magic, we think often about how to integrate individual and common good. I find living here a great way to practice cultivating a more inclusive sense of I. Lest all of this sound too serious, know that we make music, exercise, explore nature, break bread, chop wood, carry water, and put our message and other good works like collecting food for the hungry into the world with enthusiasm and joy. 
We have strong ties to this place where we've been for almost half a century. We're located in a quiet Palo Alto neighborhood in the heart of Silicon Valley and a few blocks from Stanford University. We bike easily to tens of thousands of acres of open space and in a couple of hours to Pacific Ocean beaches. Since 1976, we've purchased three adjacent homes on a half acre where heritage oaks, fruit trees, and a vegetable garden grow. Our facilities include 20 kilowatts of photovoltaic panels, community indoor and outdoor dining areas, and a shared office, exercise, music practice, workshop, and dance yoga event, event spaces. MAGIC, the public service organization, sponsors MAGIC, the service learning community, to research, teach, and demonstrate value science for common good. We value science for common good at three levels, individual, society, and biosphere. We assist individuals in improving health. We better society by increasing cooperation, and we protect the biosphere with stewardship. Currently, we emphasize individual and health, be, health and well being in value science and life planning instruction and by teaching about mindfulness, sleep, eating, strength, endurance, yoga, swimming, gratitude, and more. To better society, we promote cooperation, taking an active role in our neighborhood association and in local politics, mediating disputes, collecting farmers' surplus food for hungry people and resisting pernicious isms with word and deed. We steward the biosphere by leading groups of volunteers in planting and caring for trees and understory species, by advocating ecologically based land use, resource and transportation planning, and by teaching about threats to biodiversity and how to protect it. We attribute much of our success as an intentional community and as a public service organization to our value science based philosophy. Like bioscience, neuroscience, geoscience and other sciences named for their subject, value science is science applied to a specific subject, in this case, value. By science, we mean improved prediction. People science define repeating pattern so that we can know the future better. By questions of value, we mean, what do I want and how can I get it? By wants, we mean everything from a next meal to world peace. Ideas about value and about what's good or what we want rest upon predictions that if we get what we think we want, we'll like it. Since science is how humans make successful predictions, it's how we more accurately discern and more fully realize value. Like this toddler, learning how to put food in her mouth instead of on her face, all of us are scientists doing our best to make better predictions. Value science can be a powerful tool for creating a sustainable society. Though few have heard the word, people around the world are already value sciencing as we learn to cooperate in caring for self, others, and earth. As we at MAGIC do this, each day accumulate more evidence for its benefits. Thank you for giving me the gift of your attention. You can learn more on our website or by e emailing us to arrange a call or in-person visit. If you think you might enjoy making magic with us for a day, week, month, year, or lifetime, we'll be glad to explore possibilities with you. May you find what I offer today means to increase your and others' satisfaction. Thanks so much. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Hillary. Uh, what a great presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Are you, let's see if we can get you to have your screen sharing stop. Wonderful. Good, good. Well, that was awesome to learn more about, yeah, to learn more about magic. Um, and I love that you have such a strong service component to your community. I think that's one of the things that makes you so unique and you've been yeah. around for such a long time and you're you're in like the Silicon Valley area and doing yeah. this. <laughs> I, and I love how you call yourselves magicians. It's yeah. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, you gotta come make some magic with us. <laughs> yeah, some magic, definitely. Great. 
Well, there have been um, a number of questions uh, coming through about your community. Um, let's see here. Um, and, and folks, if you have more questions specifically for Hillary about Magic Community, um, feel free to raise your hand. We'd love to hear some different voices. Um, but just to go to some of the questions I was tracking, um, of course, people are wondering, wow, it seems like a great community. I might want to join the community or potentially live there. Um, how, how affordable would you say you all are? Or what, what does the, the cost of living at Magic look like? Well, as I outlined in the presentation, there's a combination of pay or it can be full work exchange or it can be full pay, although every community, every member of the community participates in the service and learning work at least an hour or more a week and six hours toward like the maintenance, the cooking and the cleaning. Um, but uh, so if someone is working full time and wants to pay, it's about $1,500 a month plus the six hours. But if you wanted to fully work, you just, contribute 20 hours on top of the six of the, you know, the maintenance the, that everybody contributes. So we have people here on a full range of those uh, on that spectrum. That's great. Yeah, I love that you offer the, the work exchange opportunity. Awesome. Sounds like um, you, yeah. you have a commitment to accessibility and affordability. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we really, you know, we want partners in, in our work, but, you know, we also recognize that we're small. And so we, we often like to take that slow in terms of, you know, someone comes for a day and then commits for two days and then for a week and then two weeks, because, you know, we need to make sure that the skills that we're looking for and the tasks that we need done are a good fit with whoever uh, joins us. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and folks, I think that um, Hillary is directing us towards the website to get more information and to get in touch with the community. So once again, it's just um, ecomagic.org. Is that the website? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. ecomagic.org. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Another question about how decisions are made. You had mentioned that you make decisions consensually, but some people, yeah. can you just share more about what that might mean for folks who aren't familiar with consensual well, decision making? You may have seen that I talked about the three C's, which is competence, commitment, and contribution. So we do weigh, because there are people who've been here a long time and are, you know, and, and a lot and also here for a long time versus some we do have some amount of short time term people about a third of us in non COVID times are usually like long term or people and then about two thirds are people who are here for uh, months to maybe five years. And so of course when we're making decisions about you know I don't know buildings or um, program service program directions the fellows weigh in more heavily on those things. But, you know, if we're making decisions uh, about, you know, more day-to-day -day living, you know, we include more and more of the people in the community. And the idea for me, when I mention consensus, I think people think about formal, formal consensus, but I'm really aiming to become more consensual with, with more people in more aspects of my life. And I view it as kind of a, on a spectrum you know, obviously the fellows and I, who have, we've been living and working together for over 30 years, we have a, a very great degree of influence on each other's lives from, you know, almost every aspect you can think of. But then there's people who have, are newly arrived who, you know, I have less influence on them and they have less influence open to as we get to know each other and uh, to becoming more consensual. Great, wonderful. And yeah. I see we do have a question from Diana who has raised their hand. So I'm gonna let you speak and ask her a question. 
Hi, Hillary. Thanks so much for um, sharing magic with us. It sounds really wonderful. I'm wondering if um, if the home where you all live in has any particular dietary guidelines. Well, I think that uh, you may have seen from, I remember from the presentation, I said, we, we avoid, avoid isms. So um, uh, we don't have any particular diet, but we, we do uh, consider uh, health. Is it healthful? Is it economical? Is it kind to the planet? Um, so pretty much, you know, it's everybody can eat anything that they uh, want to, but we do try to, in our common meals, keep those aspects in mind. And we always have a uh, healthful, attractive vegan option. And, and for the most part, we eat very little meat, but, you know, it depends, you know, there's been times when it's been once, once every couple of months and sometimes when it's been once a week. Um, and people are always welcome to bring whatever they want uh, to bring if, if they want to supplement. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Great. Come visit. Thank you, I will. <laughs> great, great question. And um, remind us again, Hillary, about how many people live at Magic? Well, um, as I uh, was saying it, it for COVID, we have now 14 people living here, but um, pre-COVID we had a little over 20. And so we're, we're slowly planning to rebuild where we actually have accepted a couple new people uh, who will arrive next month. But um, yeah, we, we shrunk a bit. This uh, area, as you can imagine, with Stanford basically closed and a lot of Silicon Valley people uh, fleeing the area, <laughs> um, uh, we had less, there, there's been less demand, but um, we did also decide consciously to not admit anybody who would provide any kind of risk during this COVID time. Um, my, my, my 84 year old mother lives with us. And uh, so we took a, we charted a pretty cautious path. So um, even though we did have a few people who were interested, we, we just felt like the risk of their, the accumulated, uh, uh, you know, their social interactions, you know, and the people that they interacted, social interactions just compounded. And so we were pretty content to be a, a 12 to 14 people during this year, uh, which we felt like was a pretty rich pod. <laughs> uh, uh, so I don't know, does that answer? So we, we okay. I bet by I bet in, in a year my guess is will be about twenty people. Okay. Again. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. So it is. It sounds like it's a good time if people are interested in in learning more and. Yeah. Experience. Yeah. Absolutely. But you know, for us, it's much more important to be a good fit than to be. Uh, the numbers are much less important than the uh, sharing the val values and styles and. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for for naming that. Um, so I want to I want to move on and and give other communities because there's many many questions coming <laughs> in through through the chat and the Q and A box. Um, although you did touch on one piece in mentioning that your mother, who's in her 80s, lives with you in the community. So how how would you say the experience of seniors in the community is, and and how do you relate to seniors in the community? Well, we actually have four seniors in our community, uh, people over 60. And uh, I, well, for my mom who moved here uh, three years ago to help with my son's high school education, she's a, a retired school teacher, uh, fabulous, an all around fabulous person. I think she's listening to this. And um, uh, I think it's been a great experience for her during this time. She was living alone in Palm Springs and you know, I'm sure she, my mom is a very social, wonderful person. I'm sure she would have made connections, but still she, she was part of a community where we could have hugs and, and continue our work. And I think the other seniors here are, uh, you know, you know, find this a really great place to, to age and to stay uh, healthy and 
just like my mom, she loves all the, we often have a handful of summer interns from around the world and uh, just such a rich community. Not, you're not just living with people who are only your age, you're living with people who have you know, a wide variety of experiences and we can share the risks and rewards of each age, right? Each age has its rewards and each age has its risks. Yep. Yep. For sure. Oh, beautiful. Ah, oh, sounds like a really special place. And, um, and I also want to thank you for, it sounds like you have really committed the last three decades of your life to service and supporting yeah. and growing this community. So thank you so much for, oh, for making sweet. that, that choice. And that was my pleasure. That work. It's been a good, good 30 right. years. Yeah. <laughs> sweet. All right. Well, here's to many more. Okay. Thank and you. And let's move on to um, our next community. Let's let's try again with Leslie and see if we can hear about Touchstone co-housing. Um, Leslie, are you ready? Fingers crossed. <laughs> are you gonna mute me? I guess. But... Yeah. Yeah. We'll mute and and Leslie, if you can unmute. Okay. Thank you. Let's try this again. All right, so I'm going to share. Can you have a problem where Zoom gets in the way of the control panels? Okay. <laughs> there we go. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for your patience with our technical woes. Okay, so once again, uh, my name is Leslie Daniel, and I live in Touchstone Co-Housing in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and that is Touchstone. Now, Ann Arbor Co-Housing communities are actually three co-housing communities all adjacent to each other, and if you look to the far right, that community there is Sunward. It was the first one built. And then you see the ponds. Next to that is Great Oak, the second community that was built. And Touchstone is on the end. Um, this is actually from Google Earth. And it's not an accurate picture because that little construction zone there is now built. And uh, we have new units ready for new members in our community. So the Ann Arbor co-housing communities were built um, um, as a uh, three phases of one project. And I only know of one other place in the country that's done that, and that would be Ithaca, New York. And it has its own advantages of extending our community and our resources, even though each of us functions as a fully uh, separate community. Um, because we share values and resources, we, um, we make friends across borders, if you will. And, um, and I really enjoy having uh, an extended co-housing community as well. So uh, just touching a little on what co-housing is, this will be the, the quickest and briefest of <laughs> Um, rundowns, but co-housing uh, communities are communities that are uh, legally most often are uh, condominiums. They can form as homes and neighborhoods. Uh, however, um, the concept of them is everybody owns their own unit and it's sold on the open market and we're subject to Fair Housing Act sales and things of that nature. Uh, what makes co-housing different than any other neighborhood and or um, condominium association is that we add a social layer on top of that that's about being intentional um, and uh, creating that sense of neighborhood where you know everybody and you play and you work together. So, and then you also govern your community together. So that's a real brief overview of, of co-housing. Uh, but it, on the scale of, co of intentional community, I would, I would say it's probably the closest thing to um, living in the community at large. So we're located in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is a college town in 
uh, with the University of Michigan, which is an overwhelming presence in the city. It is culturally rich. Uh, we've got music and art and um, restaurants and um, uh, geez, what, what don't we have? Um, incredible parks and places to walk. It is uh, for Michigan an amazing place to live. And Ann Arbor is located in the southeast corner. We would now be considered part of the extended Detroit metro area, though we have a pretty good um, green border around Ann Arbor. So we're not like uh, an urban area where we blend into the other cities so much. We are still somewhat distinct. So this slide is out of order, but I'm just going to think because it came up. <laughs> um, we are in touchstone, um, particularly about young families, though our ages range right now from six months to, um, I think, 86 years old. So we have a full spectrum, uh, but we take a great deal of pride at touchstone in being family oriented and multi uh, generational. So we have a lot of children and we promote that by being a pedestrian community so that they've got a whole uh, in our interior road loop is all pedestrian uh, and safe. We have playgrounds and we have playrooms and um, we love and welcome our children. Um, just to give you an idea of our statistics, we were formed in 2001 and we opened to living in 2005. We are currently 46 homes. For the first 16 years of our existence, we were 34 homes. So we've just added 12 more homes to our community. Currently, we are 51 adults and 32 children and I couldn't count all the pets. Um, we live on six acres on the outskirts of, of town and we are governed by consensus. I'll talk a little more about our governance in a bit. Um, we have six new homes that are on the market right now. Um, we survived our first 10 years without a common house. Uh, if you can see we opened in 2005 that's when the first people were able to move in and uh, unfortunately we were right in the middle of the because we were still under construction in 2005 by the way <laughs> and uh, a lot our sales just fell into the recession and so we didn't build the last 12 homes uh, initially and we didn't build our common house right off and so for a number of years, we shared the common house with Great Oak, which was one thing that really brought our communities closer together and built a lot of friendships and ties there. Um, and at year 10, we built our common house. And, uh, and here we are, we built our additional 12 homes and finished our community uh, for the pandemic. So our timing is just wonderful. <laughs> But we're coming out of it. And uh, so let's see. We persevere. Yeah, I just, yeah. I, I have to say, I don't know of another community that has hit some of the road bumps that we here at Touchstone uh, have. But I think it speaks a great deal to um, our commitment to community and honestly, the support of the other co housing communities uh, that we're close to here. Um, that we have been able to ride out and maintain throughout those uh, road bumps. And, and this picture was uh, our way of um, uh, letting people know that we were having a consensus training. So um, we have parades once in a while. That's one of our, our things is parades. Um, so what, what do we do that's community oriented? Well. Uh, one of the key things that we do is we eat meals together two to three times a week. And that's, of course, outside of COVID. Uh, we're just starting up our meal program again for the summer. We're having um, meals once a week outdoors, and hopefully we'll be able to go back to our 
multiple meals a week. Um, but uh, meals are optional. This is um, something that you sign up for. Um, meals are posted. Uh, and um, they're a wonderful part of community. And some people go to every meal and some people go to none and some people are highly selective. As a matter of fact, because we are living next to other co-housing communities, we're able to eat meals in all three communities. And so if you never wanted to cook, you can almost do it here at Touchstone. <laughs> Um, all right, so we already talked about the fact that homes here are sold on the open market. And uh, so what we do in order to encourage people who really want to be a part of co-housing is we have a very active touring uh, tour and uh, expectation uh, of people who are interested in becoming members or buying in. So we invite them to meals and we invite them to a plenary, which is our community meetings. Um, and we invite them on tours and all of these things we do in order to help them understand what we are and uh, to make sure that uh, that's something they want to buy into. We also have work expectations. Um, but what we do best is celebrations. So the picture here is some party or other that we've had. And I was looking at the picture and I realized only about half the people in that picture are touch donors. The other half are um, from the other communities. So we typically uh, celebrate with our neighbors as well. Um, so we do work days and work days are days when uh, we do those one-time jobs, a lot of it being grounds work, you know, weeding our gardens and, and turning our compost and <laughs> um, maybe a little maintenance work and things of that nature. Um, but I love work days because part, a big part of community for me is working with everybody else. And I love work days. We also have work program where you're expected over in Touchstone's case, every four months we pick jobs and uh, we do 30 hours of, on average, 30 hours of work in that four month period. Um, and that work is so varying. It can be committee work, it can be maintenance work, grounds work, it could be planning meals, cooking meals. Um, it, it, it's all over the board in terms of what we give hours for. Um, we have, I'm going to touch on um, plenaries and committees in a second. We have a vegetable garden. Uh, so if uh, people want to grow their own vegetables, we have a sunny spot and we provided all the water and, uh, and all you have to do is provide your veggies and your labor. <laughs> Um, we've got a common house I'm going to talk about in a little while, and we've got a lot of helping hands. I think one of the things that strikes people uh, and makes people feel so very at home when they move to co-housing is the fact that we're that 1950s model of you can ask your neighbor for a cup of sugar, right? So we have very active email systems and you just say, I'm looking for eggs. <laughs> Does anybody have an onion or whatnot? Um, uh, I need help moving something. Um, I need a trip to the airport. I, I've never had to take an airport or to the airport since I moved here. Um, uh, we have, we, you know, someone has had a surgery, for example, tonight I'm cooking for a neighbor because she had her hip replaced. So we run meal trains. And those are just a few examples of what it is to have that sense of community where you know everybody around you and you are connected, you know, via email. And, um, and part of being a pedestrian community in co-housing is that when you walk between your house and your car, you see people and talk. Uh, the other night I was going to go take something to a friend at the next community over and it took me 30 minutes to get there. <laughs> because I just kept running and it was a beautiful day and everybody was out and I just that's how long it took me to get through the conversations between me and them and they're two minutes away. <laughs> 
So I'm um, going to touch a little on governance. Um, the way in which we govern ourselves is consensus here at uh, Touchdown. Um, and that involves um, a lot of work and training on our parts and understanding what consensus looks like and building up our proposals. And we have committees and everybody's expected to work on those committees. We don't have property management companies. So everything that you need to do to run the community, you know, that you would pay a property management company for ordinarily, we do ourselves. So both the social policy aspect of it and the nitty gritty maintenance and getting the lawns mowed. All of that is something that we choose to do in house. And we do that with a number of different committees and uh, community meetings and an active facilitation program and conflict management because that is a part of a lot of diverse people living together. So um, I, I'm just going to say we have a common house and our common house is our communal life. Um, that's where most of our life happens. And unlike uh, a condo association, this is something we're in and out of every day. We don't charge ourselves to use it. We have an amazing uh, internal website where uh, we can get reservations and sign up for me the meals. It's called Gather. Uh, and uh, we've actually made that available to other co-housing communities to help them organize themselves. It's amazing. Um, so just to give you an idea of what our common house is, it's a commercial kitchen, it's a dining room. We have a guest room uh, where you can just sign up and have your guests stay. We have a sitting room, which is also half a meeting room. So where we do a lot of our committee meetings. Uh, we have a children's playroom. We have a media room, which is where TV is and where kids set up you know, to play computer games or whatever. <laughs> uh, we have a laundry, which, you know, if you have a laundry in your home, that's an option. I do. Some people don't have a laundry in their home. They use the laundry at the common house. Um, and we have an office. So it, it, oh, and we have a computer nook. I forgot to put that on there. So you can, uh, I do all my printing at the common house, for example. Um, super quick, we are environmentally sensitive here. We, our common house is platinum lead, which is a measure of, of the efforts we went to uh, be environmentally sustainable in the construction of that facility. It's the, uh, geothermally heated and cooled. We have community gardens. We're active composters, recyclers. We have policies like pesticide free and fragrance free and uh, things of that nature to be sensitive to the environment. So um, how do you get a hold of us and learn more? Uh, we have tours every Sunday at 2 p.m. And that is a tour that is of all three of the Ann Arbor co-housing communities. But since we're still in COVID, we're doing that by appointment only. But we really do encourage people uh, to come and join us. We have a Facebook page. This is the picture on our Facebook page, just so you know you're in the right place. We're sunflowers. <laughs> And those are really our sunflowers. Um, and we have a website which is listed here. And if you go to our website for COVID, we put on um, a, uh, a number of videos as a virtual tour to get a lot of questions answered that we weren't able to, to do in person. So, and that, that is our last group uh, photo of our community. Um, a lot of changes I noticed from this photo. Uh, we're a college town, so we're ever turning over. And, uh, you know, uh, other people have touched on diversity, and um, we do have diversity in Touchstone. It's mostly a, a, um, a diversity born of, of people coming into from other countries for, uh, for the university. So a huge number of people um, who are foreign born have chosen to live in community, which I find fascinating. So 
Um, I had another video, but I do believe I've probably spent my 10 minutes. So I think we'll have to put yeah. that. Up. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Wonderful. Uh, there you go. Great. Thank you so much for that presentation. Oh, no. Where has Leslie gone? I think they just dropped out. Um, okay, hopefully she'll be coming back in. Um, and it was so nice though to hear about Touchstone co-housing. It seems like another one of those like really idyllic uh, co-housing communities. Okay, Leslie, there you are. Can you hear us? You have to unmute. Sorry about that. You would think I didn't know anything about tech. And we are so <laughs> wired here at Touchstone. And here I am, and I can't run my computer at all. <laughs> no, perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. Thank you for sharing and for that presentation. It, it was really rich and clear. And I, I love seeing the photos of the community, like all the different ages and your sunflowers. And it just, it seems like a really sweet place. Yeah. I like it. And good, good. It's good that we have people on here who enjoy living in the places that they're, they're living in. And uh, there have been a number of questions coming in. Um, a lot of questions around how one goes about becoming a member at Touchstone, how, you know, what your membership process looks like how you decide who joins, who doesn't join, and also if you could touch on any fees for joining or for purchasing a unit. Okay, so um, in co-housing, this is a housing community. So to become a member, you need to buy in or rent within the community. So anybody living here is uh, automatically a member of Touchdown. Um, to Find out what's available in terms of purchase or rent. Uh, I recommend going to our website and our Facebook page um, and or you know, coming to a um, tour. Um, you can make an appointment for a tour at the moment. So it's all about letting us know what you're looking for and, uh, and making an opportunity to um, come and see us. And by the way, uh, on a frequent basis, we've had people who were interested and they were physically, you know, halfway across the country. And we will do um, virtual um, Zoom meetings with them so that they can meet some people and, and verbally have questions answered and things of that nature. We've actually had people buy without ever showing up. Oh, you have? Okay. That was one of the questions we had from another um, co-housing community like is it something where you you require a certain number of conversations before joining in sounds like that can happen virtually now but what the association expects is that anybody buying in and remember co-housing is is um, owner you know this is privately owned property just like a condominium so it's sold on the open market. But what we as an association look for is that people attend a tour, even if it's a virtual tour, uh, attend a meal, um, and uh, attend one of our plenaries, which is our version of a community meeting, just to uh, get a better understanding of who we are. And uh, a lot of our Foundational documents are available on the website. So if you want a, a sense of what do our bylaws look like, for example, uh, you can always okay. read those things. Okay, great. Yeah, and I see we've put the, the link in the chat. So folks, if you have questions about membership process, about the costs and what's available currently, I encourage you to go check out the website. And you okay. know what? I'm gonna just put out here just to make sure that everybody on this, um, doesn't find any barriers, my email address. And that is Leslie, spelled my way without the E on the end, Leslie Touchstone at gmail.com. And I will make sure that if you email me that I will connect you with the appropriate people. Oh, that's very sweet. Thank you so much. 
Uh, one more question for you before we move on to our last community to present. Um, there was some questions about how your community handles conflict, like if you have any conflict management, conflict resolution processes. Um, we do. We have a whole committee dedicated to conflict resolution. Um, and that is, is for people who are having interpersonal relationship issues with somebody else in the community, just to provide th that safe container for that conversation. Um, otherwise, we work conflict through using various uh, processes that we've learned in the training uh, within our meetings. Uh, we all our meetings are pretty much all our meetings are facilitated. Okay, nice. Good. It's good to have good processes and structures in place around that because conflict happens for sure in community. Okay. It's all those people right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Leslie. And let's go on now from, let's see, we were in California, we went over to Michigan. Now we're going all the way to Hawaii. And we have La Akea community. I'm not sure if I'm saying the name of your community right. Okay, good, good. Um, go ahead and share. Let's see if I, I may be missing your audio. I've got myself unmuted. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. All right. Just to say uh, a disclaimer, we're out in, the, in a rural area in Hawaii, so our internet is a little wobbly. So we might freeze in the middle of a word for a moment, <laughs> but we'll come back. <laughs> so my name is Amara and I've been uh, involved with La Akea community for about 13 years. And this is Tracy. Hi, I'm one of the founding members. So I've been here for 16 years. Yeah, so um, we're really happy to be here with all of you today. And I am going to do a little share screen we have been having technical issues today, such as the power going out, um, but we managed to be here, yay. All right, so. will cooperate with me. It's not cooperating very well. And uh, we did see the presentation before. Um, yes, I know. I'm no, trying to reshape the screen so that enough. all you see is <laughs> that. Um, I know that you can see our, um, here we go. This is what I want this little box. Great. All right. What's that? Yeah. Good. Looks great. Excellent. <laughs> All right. So uh, we are a permaculture community and we live uh, near a small town called Pahoa on the big island of Hawaii. And hang on just a second. Switch screen. And that's what I'm trying to do. Like I said, I couldn't really um, set this up very well before. My... All right. Did you hit the arrow key? If I'm hitting the arrow key and nothing's happening. Okay. Well, while she's playing with that, I can talk to you a little bit. So we are completely off grid, hence our slight technological issues that happen frequently. Um, so we are a community that you would be interested in joining if you are interested in the experiment and exploration of not always having access to technology. <laughs> so it's a really good uh, opportunity to have that little wake up call of what does it mean to be integrated into the system. Um, out here, you get a great opportunity to disengage from that. In fact, uh, cell phone signal is very wobbly. And um, oftentimes people that are wanting to make important calls or video conferences 
actually need to drive to town. Um, but luckily that's only a, a 10 minute drive away. So it's not that big of a deal. But that said, this is a place to come if you're interested in how to live together with people and the land in a really close uh, situation where sustainability with each other in our relationships and with growing our own food and having animals and systems like that, um, solar voltaic, solar thermal, catching rainwater, um, all that kind of stuff is happening here. Yeah, it's a beautiful rural jungle lifestyle. So we've been together for about 16 years from the beginning, um, formed from a small group of people that met each other at a Network for New Culture camp. I'm not sure if you know knows that group, but it's a group really interested in exploring, um, creating new culture, creating new relationship uh, structures. And um, they got together and decided to get a piece of land in Hawaii uh, so currently we're 10 adults and two children and our children are around 13 years old right now and uh, we're born here and so it's a very small and tightly knit chosen family you know it's more like a family feeling than anything else and we're we're very involved with each other very involved with each other emotionally and it's very supportive um, as I said, we're living in a rainforest area of the big island of Hawaii up at about 1200 feet. So it's very wet. It rains a lot, which means the plants look like this <laughs> and things grow like crazy. You can watch some of the bamboo and the grass growing like an inch a day. Um, and we're totally off the grid. So uh, each of our buildings has its own solar system, if it has it at all, and we catch rainwater. Sometimes each of our buildings has its own rainwater catchment also, and then we filter it using the solar electric. And we've got about 24 acres of incredible lush jungle, including our permaculture farm. So our farm, how many acres do you think we have developed? Maybe five out of the 24? Well, if we're talking about food, yeah, and I orchards. Would say at least, I'd say probably six. Or Maybe less. six acres, yeah. And so we have um, a big fence to garden and we need to fence it because there's lots of things that want to eat our food like wild pigs and <laughs> chickens. And so um, we fence in this huge garden and we also build our own private houses, each of us um, at, in the process after we've joined the community, which takes a while and we'll talk about that more later. Um, we create our own housing but we do share a common house and a kitchen. Yeah, so one thing I wanna point out about we having our own houses is really we have our own structures for retreat. So typical considerations, people think of a house and they think, oh yeah, so you've got your bathroom and your kitchen and, and you have a house. Well, for us, it's more like you have a cottage or you have a cabin. Um, and so we all have our little places that we go to sleep and if we want like a little retreat space, but other than that, the kitchen is at the main house, the um, showers are at the main house, the, the hot house. tub is at the main house. Right. <laughs> the, um, uh, we have a library space and other, nobody lives at the main house. Um, and also um, we set up our own, like I said, solar systems in each cabin. And we have various, well, most of our, um, we don't have bathrooms, we have outhouses. So and those are scattered around the land and then we capture our human humanure and let it ferment and then we feed our trees with it. So we recycle everything we can in that way. Um, we also keep smaller private gardens around each, each of our houses besides our large permaculture garden. And um, we do work parties uh, four days a week in the morning for a few hours. and. Uh, we expect our farm supporters to come to that. We encourage our members to come to that, and we, but we don't require it. We don't require any particular amount of work from our members. However, we really value contribution. And so someone who really doesn't like to do anything, it, it, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> because there's a lot to do on a farm and also uh, many 
uh, human interactions things to happen also. So uh, we, we're a group of people that really values um, contribution and uh, good work, work ethic. And we also have chickens. And we've got a large enclosed yard um, for the chickens. Chickens, how much do you think half an acre? No, it's an acre. We, the first five years of community, we played keep the chicken out because we all had this great idea that we <laughs> wanted to have free range birds. Um, and so that became keep the human in. So after <laughs> the first five years, we decided to shift that. And for me, that's an example of what living here is like. It's like a daily experiment. So every right. day is like, how can we be more sustainable with each other in the land? And what can we do to nurture that kind of connection? So as time has gone by, definitely a lot of our systems have gotten a lot more dialed in for sure. It's still that opportunity exists for the freshness and the newness for whatever happens to come along for us to get an opportunity to look at it. And together, because we do our decisions by consensus, um, figure out what we're gonna do. Yeah, it's always an experiment. And if it doesn't work, we make it different. So we also have uh, currently a couple of sheep. Uh, we used to have a flock of sheep, but then the volcano started going off, which is actually very close to where we live. <laughs> yeah. And it was raining down little bits of fiberglass on our grass. And so we had to get rid of the sheep until the volcano decided it wanted to quiet down. So that's another thing about living in Puna is um, you have to be very um, adventurous. Yes. <laughs> And have a lot of let go. <laughs> and have a lot of let go, but luckily our land was totally fine, even though there was lots of lava flowing about a mile away. Yeah, maybe three miles away. Okay. Yeah. Close. Um, yeah, it was, it was, um, that was exciting. That was in 2018. So here's our sheep and they're kind of like pets. Um, they take them for walks and, uh, we also have fruit orchards. We've got a big citrus orchard with all kinds of oranges and lemons and grapefruits and a lot of bananas and many other kinds of trees um, that are too numerous to list, but lots of tropical fruit. And so, like I've said several times, for us, it's a knowledge of permaculture, as well as having a large toolbox for communication and personal growth skills. So that's what we're looking for in people that want to become members here. The thing that we've learned is the most challenging part is relationship and being able to interface with each other. But you can't really interface with someone else if you can't interface with yourself. So a lot of it is being willing to own what's alive inside of you and look at that because you can't dance. I mean, you can dance alone. What am I trying to say? Anyway, you get the idea. Got to dance alone first. So dance alone first and then you can dance with others pretty well. So all of us have skills like peer counseling, um, NBC, compassionate communication, uh, all, all different kinds of things. Okay, go ahead. There we go. That's outside. Oh, that's outside. Okay. <laughs> so we also use Zeg Forum. Um, that's actually how Network for Culture got established with a group of people went and visited Zeg as a community in Germany. And then they decided to bring the ideals and a lot of the models back to the West Coast. And they meet every summer in Oregon. And now it's also on the East Coast and other places. And, um, and we host it too. Yeah, we host Winter Camp, which is a Network for New Culture event. I had and, to miss the last year, but yeah. this year, but uh, hopefully we'll do it again next year. Back to that one. Okay, so we're a partial income sharing community. Uh, so for those of you that don't know what that means, that means that everybody has their own financial responsibilities and their own financial pieces. And then we also contribute a monthly fee to a common kitty. And from that common kitty, things like uh, food, propane, land maintenance things, improvements, all that stuff comes from the common kitty. We have a buy list that we decide together about what the community is authorized to purchase. And if it's not on that list, you have to get approval to do so, or you have to buy it yourself. And so, yeah, that's what that looks. Currently, if you are a member, membership fees are $250 a month, but that's all inclusive. 
such a deal. Yeah, I know. We are an awesome model <laughs> for uh, low income housing. To become a member, we ask for $35,000, but that is something that you can commit to over time. And we are fairly anti-interest. So that means that you get an opportunity to look at what your income is and how much you can afford to pay each month towards your equity. Mm -hmm. So we also work together on group projects. Um, we were having a lot of gatherings before COVID. We're planning on having them again. And this is a picture of one of them where we had a circle at a seed exchange we were doing. So p local people saving their own seeds and then bringing them and trading them. And that's a lot of fun. It's one of our commu uh, community contributions. And as I said, um, yeah, uh, this is the meeting room in our common house uh, where we have our, our uh, indoor space with our um, wood-fired stove. So if we wanna do something warm and snugly, we go into this room. And we have uh, other large outdoor spaces also. So for meetings, we have a heart chair once a week. Um, that is a time where we come together in the evening after dinner and do different kinds of connective sharing, practicing authentic transparency with each other. Um, oftentimes it could be an extended check-in. It could look like some milling. Um, it, yeah. It could be massaging each other. It could be emotional processing, like helping people who are having conflicts that need the group support. Yeah. We also have a weekly business meeting. And that takes about two hours once a week. And then we have daily check-ins, which are optional. You either show up or you don't. And we have five communal meals a week. Yeah. Yes. So, And the communal meals, we take turns cooking them. So we each have a cook shift and a cleaning shift every week. And we are expected to show up for those. <laughs> and that's kind of cool because you get to cook once a week, but you get to eat four more times without having to do any of the work. Right. And then the you know breakfasts and lunches are just from our own communal uh, stash of food. Everybody comes in and makes their own. Now, when it's a large group of people, which sometimes it is, we have a lot of visitors and guests, then we have more uh, shared cooked meals because our kitchen's too small to have. 20 people come in and make breakfast all at once. Right. And one thing you can also tell from this picture is living in Hawaii means that a lot of our living gets to be outside. Right. This is our covered front porch on the main house. So one of the unusual and special things about our community is that we're very open to alternative relationship styles. So um, whoever you're loving is fine. However many people you're loving is fine. So a number of us are polyamorous, which means we um, have open relationships that are above board. They're transparent. We talk about it. We aren't sneaking off to have affairs. We're like saying, well, I'm interested in this. And then what do you think? And we're negotiating sometimes with a number of people. There are some other people here who are not in any relationships um, or choosing to be monogamous. So we value all the different choices about autonomy and sexual. And as we said before, we make our important long-term decisions by consensus. And for us, that is um, more than just what you might think of as important and long-term decisions. Many, many things are brought to the business meeting and everybody attends the business meeting, at least all the members do. And the members are the ones that make the decisions. And right now, as we said before, there are 10 members so that means 10 people sitting in a room together with an agenda board and a facilitator. We rotate facilitation. So that's an important skill we want everybody to have. If you don't know how to do that, you get to learn it. And then we talk about everything from... Color of the kitchen walls? No, we, we, we learned early on that that <laughs> one needs to be subcommitted pretty quickly. <laughs> we, we have learned that there are things that are better done as small groups or individuals and having let go and that there are other things that we can work on together to um, figure out. Yeah. So it depends upon that. Aesthetics are, are usually subcommittee out. Um, when we first started community, I think we spent 
a whole day discussing what color we were going to paint the kitchen wall. <laughs> it was a little much. <laughs> it was a little much, so we don't do that anymore. <laughs> but um, other things like, you know, how are we going to improve the road? Or how many animals do we want to have on the land? If, if it's like looking at a big number, not just a couple more whatevers. That kind of stuff all comes to the meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people that visit with us, you know, we talk about their, we allow people to come visit, we allow people to um, come do work trade, and um, we talk about that in meetings too, like if people want to stay longer, we talk about how they're fitting in, mm -hmm. and whether, and we all need to be a hell yes for them to stay longer than yep. a month. We let a bunch of people come just for a month, but then we're uh, a little more cheesy after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as it says, we own the land in common, and yeah. we all pay, each one of us pays a portion towards a buy-in or to have equity in the land when you become a member, and that helps us ensure authentic power balance. So, like I said earlier, the buy-in is $35,000. Um, it started off at fifty, and we had that for quite a long time, but then we lowered it because we were feeling we're, we're good. Um, when people leave, you get a certain percentage of that back. In fact, you get most of it back. Um, and yeah, we we um, have it almost paid off. We don't have a bank loan. Oh, the land's paid off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's great. We don't have to pay anybody anything except you know property tax on our land. So yeah. that feels really great. But the buying in the on the land doesn't include building your own house. No. So when people are you know joining us, then they usually live in one of our extra houses. And we do have a number of little cabins and huts and um, places like that for people to stay. They stay in those for a while yeah. until um, we all decide that we're, we're happy together. Yeah. Um, and so we intend to expand to somewhere between 12 and 15 or, or maybe more, but we don't know, full-time members, depending on what feels good. Okay. Um, the ways to come visit us check it out, explore, or you can come as a farm supporter. You can just come as a visitor. The difference between those two is a farm support requires a month long commitment and it requires that you're able and desiring to contribute to the hard work of living on a farm. And if that is not the category that you are in, then you're welcome to come as a visitor. Visitors pay a little bit more, but there's no work expectation for them. Um, but you're also included in everything that's going on here. We are looking for new members and the process to become a member is of course to come and live with us at first. Whether that's as a farm supporter or a visitor, we would want you to live with us for a minimum of a month before then you could request to be a trial member. Trial members live with us for six months and during that six month period, you're asked to participate in everything. You come to all the business meetings and the heart chairs, you participate as if you were a member. The only difference is in our consensus decision-making process, you're not allowed to block. And of course, another big decision, uh, big difference is that um, if it's not working out and you're a trial member, we might ask you to leave. Um, that's right. true too. So when we do accept someone for membership, uh, then they join the LLC that owns the land and they get on all of the papers. Um, and we do have a process for asking someone to leave or if someone chooses to leave and giving them part of their money back. Uh, I think it's about two thirds of the money back. Yep, we yeah. get about two thirds back. Yeah. So if you wanna check us out more, you can watch videos about us. There's, we have a number of videos up at our website, uh, permaculture-hawaii.com. And we are gonna be open to questions now. We are gonna stop the share. We're gonna make sure we are frozen quickly. Yeah, all right, yay. Yay, thank you so much, Tracy and Amara. That was a very rich and informative presentation about your community. And I love I loved seeing the photos of all the lush green. I'm like, oh yes, the rainforest in Hawaii sounds amazing. So yeah, so cool. Half of the half of the uh, job here is just keeping the rainforest from taking over your buildings. <laughs> yeah. If you turn around for a couple months, you can't see the buildings anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can imagine. Wow. 
Okay, well, I feel like we've been on such a whirlwind of seeing the real diversity of the intentional communities movement from urban, service-oriented, permaculture, co-housing, rural, all, all kinds of diversity. And there's a lot more diversity out there too. Um, so thank you each for giving us a little taste of each of your communities. Uh, I am realizing we only have about five minutes left in our 90 minute time for this event. So we may consider making these events a little longer in the future. Um, and I think that there were so many questions about La Caya community specifically, but I think you answered most of them through your presentation. So thanks for being so thorough with that. Um, and maybe we'll have time just for one more question that each of you can answer kind of to round out our time together. Um, I'd love for you each to reflect on as community residents and thinking about your own communities, what would you say is the real value of living in intentional community, especially during, during this time? And maybe for someone who has never lived in an intentional community before, what would you say is like, yeah, the real value, the importance, the uh, what you maybe get the most out of community living? And feel free, whoever would, would like, like to go, go first. first. Whoever, whoever feels inspired to. Um, okay, I'll, I'll speak to that. I think it's literally the small things. Uh, and and co-housing the rule is if you want to be social, you walk out your door. And um, and it, it's, it's just those little opportunities every day um, to interact with people and, and having that community to reach out to. Um, it almost becomes a norm. I have to remind myself, I have to remind others often that um, we forget that. We forget that living in the larger culture can be very isolating and very lonely um, because we take for granted very quickly how much opportunity we have uh, for just the little interactions every day. Sweet, thank you. Yeah, for me, okay. it's about Hello. personal growth. And I feel um, there's a complete lack of any isolation or loneliness. In fact, sometimes there's too many people for me. <laughs> so any kind of connection I want, light or deep, is available easily just by coming to the main house or making a date with some, one of the people that's here. And when, I, when you live, when I live this close with so many people, they're all like mirrors. So they give me lots of opportunities to see where I have triggers. And then I can look and see where's that trigger coming from and work, do my own personal work to um, communicate well with them and also own my own stuff. And there's many opportunities for that. And we've gotten really good at it. We're actually yeah. have a high level of mastery in this community. And, um, and like Tracy said, we look for people who also have experience in doing that um, uh, personal growth work, counseling work, understanding emotions. Okay. Great. Well, you just took the word right out of my mouth. I think the yeah, opportunities, I think first you often think of sharing resources, which I think has obviously a huge uh, uh, positive impact on terms of, you know, we need to be using less and creating uh, less hazards in our world today. But I think the hidden thing that people don't realize about community is that it's an awesome way to know yourself and other people better and real, like, because you can't like put on your you know persona to go to work you know they you see each other every day and I think it's it's it it's just such a wonderful way to learn learn about yourself and to grow yeah yeah for sure 
And Tracy, did you want to add anything? Not really, except that what everybody said is exactly right on. I mean, I guess I would say one thing, which is for me, this community, especially, it's like finding tribe. It's finding my chosen family. So I often felt um, in my family of origin misunderstood, and now I don't. So that's really nice. Yeah, family based on shared values. Yes. Yes, family based on shared values. Beautiful. Good. All right. Well, I um, put a link in the chat, folks, if you want to let us know what you thought about this event, if you have feedback or ideas for future events, the link is ic.org slash events eval. And also a reminder about that 30% off discount code for two of our upcoming online courses. And thank you all so much, everyone who is listening in. I think we had well over 200 people who registered for this event. So clearly there is a hunger out there to learn more about intentional communities. So thank you each, wherever you are, if you're living in a community, if you're just learning about them for the first time, thanks for being here. Thanks for being curious and on the journey. And uh, thank you also to our wonderful presenters. Thank you um, for, you know, some of you getting up early, some of you for taking time out of your days. Just really appreciate your sharing um, and looking forward to connecting with you more. All right, so we can, uh, we can say goodbye and uh, hope to see you all on an upcoming virtual tour event. We hope to do this every month. So be on the lookout for the next email about the next one. Thanks, yeah. you did great. Awesome facilitation, yeah. thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, take care, bye-bye.